standing out of the water so that I don't get caught. Just giving them some water before we talk about them. So while they're getting some water, I want to say to you, thanks so much for subscribing to the channel. Really appreciate it. We're finally at a thousand subscribers and also the channel has been monetized and I could not have done this without you guys. So if you are into plants and you've not subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, uh, like, comment, ask questions. So yeah, I'm starting to get a little wet and I'm going to have to turn this off soon. So today we're basically just going to talk about bromeliads, okay? So if you've always wondered, wonder no more because here comes the information. Okay, so there are three different subfamilies of bromeliads. Okay, so bromeliads, the bromelicea family is broken up into three. Okay, namely bromeliodiae, pitkeniodiae, and telanciodiae. The entire family of bromeliads or bromelicea have got roughly around three, three and a half thousand, a little bit more than three and a half thousand different species. Okay, so guys, let me just say to you that this has been a struggle to put this episode together because I'm just like racking my brain and, and I think I'm overcomplicating things. So what I've done is I have put together all of the bromeliodiae species together so that you can see them. So we'll go through some of them real quick. First and foremost, obviously, is the pineapple. So the pineapple was brought to the New World from, or from the New World to into cultivation, even though it has been, was already in use since about the 1400s, as far back as they can tell, probably earlier. Um, the pineapple is probably the most well-known of the bromeliads because it produces, well, the pineapple, of course which is an edible fruit and contains a chemical called bromelain, which is used as a meat tenderizer. So that is the pineapple. In this bromelio bromelioidea subfamily are also the nidulariums. So this is a nidularium right here. And this one is currently in flower, which is stunning. And uh, again, with respect to bromeliodiae, they are characterized by having inferior ovaries. They will produce berries when they um, come to seed. So on the inside there you will find uh, if these any of these are successfully pollinated you will find berries down in the base there. Same thing with the neurogelias and also the acneas and the berries are usually brightly colored and uh, they are edible. Nidularum is no exception. So let's move to the next one. Next is the prestigious, the one, the only, the Acmea. This is Acmea Correa Arujoy. Um, and here you can actually see a little bit more sort of telltale signs about the Bromeliodiae that they are epiphytic which means they grow in trees. So this plant here, if I just kind of hold it out and you can see that, if I put that and I hang that up, that will make a really beautiful statement piece um, hanging in midair. And this, this is where that plant belongs. It grows in trees. And so with the acmeas, if I show you another acmea, which is a very common acmea, this is uh, Acmea fasciata, which was again brought from the New World into cultivation around the 1700s. And this is a very popular, very common bromeliad in terms of the Acmea genus is where it gets its name from. Acmea refers to the spiky flowers which the Acmeas produce when they bloom. So they also have these narrow rosettes and really spiny teeth along the margins of the leaves and then also that characteristic um, banding on the underside and sometimes also on the inside of the rosette. So that is Acmea fasciata 
a very old, very well-known bromeliad. Okay, next in this family is Hohenbergia. Now Hohenbergia is also a very stunning bromeliad in the subfamily Bromelioideae and also has lots of trichomes which are the silvery sort of what gives a lot of the bromeliads that silvery color to them and that helps them to actually deal with environmental stresses really well. Okay, then we've got the Neurogelias. So these are all Neurogelias here and they are characterized by having these absolutely ridiculous blushes. So this change in color in the foliage uh, of the leaves here is basically referred to as a blush and so sometimes Neurogelias are referred to as blushing bromeliads, right? They also have spines. They make your arms itch because they have so many uh, serrated little teeth on the edge of the of the leaf, much like an acmea. But they've got a different growth habit. They are definitely also, for the most part, epiphytic, which means they grow in trees. But you can see, compared to an acmea, it's a lot more open. It's a lot more flat. If I, if I sort of do that, right? So what's interesting about this bloom is this bloom never, the, the, the flower plate always stays below the surface of the water. And then at the start of each day, so this one here, you see that the flowers begin to rise out of the plant, out of the, the little pond of water in there. And uh, it's usually between one and say seven flowers I've counted at most. And that basically the plant will flower and then by midday those flowers will close and return back below the surface of the water. And then in, as that begins to happen the next two will actually begin to poke their, their petals out and you can see that right there. Last but not least in the Bromeliodiae subfamily of Bromelicea, which are the bromeliads, is Edmundoa. So this is an example of an Edmundoa. And this plant is basically, it's got like a very weird flower. It's kind of furry. Uh, it's got white flowers when it does bloom. This is the inflorescence just appearing right now. And again, it does have spines, very soft, very easy spines. I can actually run my hand along it. Um, and it's also water holding but the flower feels like kind of like sandpaper it's very strange and sort of brown which is not really a very pretty color so that is Edmundoa right and that concludes Bromelioidae guys so now let's move to Pitcairnia or Pitcairnioidae with a Pitcairnioidae subfamily this includes genera such as uh, Dickias, Fosterellas, Hectia, Pitcania, Puya, Encolurium, and Deuteraconia, of which I've got a few um, and I'm going to show you some of them. Right. This plant is a Deuteraconia. So Deuteraconia, very unusual bromeliad, doesn't really look like a bromeliad, um, but if you know what to look for you can kind of go, hey yeah it kind of does. Uh, Fosterella. Fosterella is busy dying now because it is currently in flower but there is a pup coming off the side there and this is the flower so you can actually see that it is quite big it's a very tall flower spike and it is still in bloom and producing seed at the same time so they've got half inferior ovaries uh, and these seeds are basically windborne so the wind will actually blow the seed away uh, and that is let me just see if i can show you a flower that is a fosterella bloom very pretty tiny little thing pitkenioidea then we have two others so both of these here are puyas this is puya mirabilis seed grown and uh, they are looking a bit tatty and then there's also the dickia so that's this is what a dickia looks like they look very similar in fact to one another which is not surprising that they belong to the same 
uh, subfamily. And then of course there is the poster child for Pitkenia, Pitkenia undulata. This is a this is actually in the genus Pitkenia in the subfamily Pitkenia So this is why it was called this. So this is a very beautiful plant and this is a water loving terrestrial or Saxicolis bromeliad. So you'll find it growing on rocks. You'll also find it growing in the ground. And it is uh, quite a big family composed of about 400 species, give or take. And uh, it doesn't look anything like a bromeliad, funny enough, does it? So there you can see how it sort of comes out of the ground and it's got these really, really sharp spikes as it emerges from the soil and you don't want to step on this stuff because they will break off in your skin and it will be very painful. Um, it doesn't really have a lot in the way of spines, but if I show you along its petioles, you can actually see, or the stems that support the leaves, you can actually see a little bit of serration on those petioles right there before the leaf begins. Even some of the leaves have got a little bit of serration on them. And that is Pitkenioidea, or Pitkenia. This is Pitkenia undulata. Last but definitely not least is the Talansioidea group, which is a huge family. And you can see there are obviously many plants that I've got just sort of lying all over the floor over here. And Pitkenia is the largest group. So first Bromelioidea with the fewest number of species, then uh, Pitkenioidea with the sort of intermediate number and Talansioidea contains the largest group. And this is basically a lot of the bromeliads that we find in cultivation that are stunning and beautiful aside from the Neurogelias and the Acmeas. Uh, the Alcantarias, this is Alcantaria geniculata. Okay, and then we've got some of the Guzmanias. These are just Guzmanias that I'm going to repot tomorrow. So I've actually taken them all out today. And this is why I'm actually filming. Uh, Freesia. A large portion of the Talansioidea are spineless. So they have no spines on their leaves. And they are the, I don't know, call it the pretty boys. You know, the, the pretty bromeliads. They also include the family Talansia, which is these guys. So these are all the uh, air plants, as people know them, right? So I just turn that piece of wood around. You can actually see that there are a few different types of Talansias on this here. And then Itla Okla, which is the uh, Spanish beard or old man's beard. I prefer to call it Itla Okla. This is also a bromeliad in the Talansioidea subfamily. Another one in the subfamily Talansioidea is of course uh, this should not be there because that is a nigellarium. Can you guess which one this belongs to? You guessed it, Bromelioidea. Catopsis. Now this uh, this is a very ancient plant. Um, it's believed that they actually are carnivorous, as bromeliads go, and. Um, like Brochinia, which is found on the Guiana Shield in South America, um, they are also uh, very old. Um, they, they've come a very, very long way, evolutionarily speaking. It's also known as the Forest Lantern because of the beautiful glow that it has on the underside. It's got this white powder, which then just comes off on your finger like so and then one of my favorites Guzmania I like Guzmanias they're a bit overrated I suppose you find them in stores and in the backdrop of soap operas and things all the time uh, and they are cool climate bromeliads I would like to think because they don't like the heat that we have in Africa um, they generally like cooler temperatures and they are definitely epiphytic as is as are most of the plants in this subfamily of Talansioidea. 
Here's another giant Guzmania. Here's another giant Guzmania. And you can see that it is currently in flower right now. Uh, very stunning plant, all these beautifully colored bracts. And they're obviously pollinated by hummingbirds as, as are most of the bromeliads. And there you can see some of the pups. So again, they are characterized by having absolutely no spines. They are smooth. Okay, and they have these beautiful colors right at the base of the plant. That is a Guzmania, very soft, very delicate, cooler temperatures, does not like harsh conditions. And then last, but definitely not least, is Mesobromelia. Now Mesobromelia, this is a, a, a plant that has only two, it has only two species in the genus of Mesobromelia. Um, and this is one of them, Mesobromelia pleostachia. A very stunning plant as well. Very big, massive. It's probably about a meter and a half across. And then just as a bit of titillation for those bromelia lovers out there, let's take a look at something that I'm really proud of right now that is currently in flower. This is Alcantaria Imperialis Rubra, which if you've guessed it, you can definitely guess that this is a Talansioidea subfamily member. This is a very stunning bromeliad. It is 11 years old right now and it will flower once in its lifetime and then it will perish. It will produce seed, but before it does, uh, well I mean before it dies, it will produce some seed. They are full sun plants, absolutely spineless, really ridiculously stunning. Uh, and yeah, what a privilege to actually get to see this. So that is, that was, that's my story on bromeliads for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Guys, just a side note. I know this is a, could be a lot to take in. Probably is a lot to take in if your name's not Gabriel. Uh, but what I will say is I will break it down in the next coming weeks and give you one genus at a time. Key instructions, growth habit, and the uses of the plant. So stay tuned for that. Okay, back to the video. And that, my friends, is the end of the episode. I hope that wasn't too complicated. I hope that I didn't just completely blow your mind with way too much information. Uh, I hope it was bite-sized enough to actually absorb and take on board and that you walk away understanding more about Bromelids than you did before you watched this. So catch you in the next episode. Have a good one and stay safe. Bye for now.